Afro-American militancy, the Garvey movement. Tonight we will give the second part in a, a two-part uh, discussion of the Garvey movement. The aim is not to merely summarize the movement, uh, as telling us what its major goals were and uh, that sort of thing, but rather to try to give a feeling of what it was like. Um, we're leaving out some uh, very important details, but just would like to convey an idea of, uh, of how it worked in a day-to-day -day level. Um, and, and in addition, tackle some uh, of the ideological problems that we're trying to tackle in this series as a whole. For instance, there is the question of just how radical was the black nationalism of Garveyism. And um, one of, the, of course, the ways one might uh, look at radicalism in black organization was uh, how deeply was it ingrained in helping the masses rather than a few? How um, far did it go in really conveying an approach which would help all Negroes, and Negroes as a large group, rather than help a few individuals and accent, you know, sort of spiritual uplift or something of that sort, which really rapidly degenerates from radicalism into conservatism. The Garvey movement obviously uh, went farther than any movement has gone in Afro-American history in rallying the masses and accenting the mass in masses as a group and individuals as a whole, black people. They certainly, uh, the Garveyites certainly, were detached from American mores and ways out in their own world, their own social world. They didn't go on to adopt socialism or unity with the Socialist International, the other major force in the world, uh, of course, besides nationalism, which rallies a whole large groups on a group basis. And yet, for all the fighting, and there was certainly a lot of fighting, between Garveyites and individual socialists, the issue of a collectivist ideology was never resolved within the UNIA. The Garveyite businesses were cooperatively run. Money and all went to the group as a whole, to be used for the group and organization as a whole. Um, and socialists participated in UNIA conventions and in chapters um, pretty much right on up through the late 1920s. According to a, a uh, little history of the movement by Mrs. Amy Jacks Garvey, a very valuable book, Garvey and Garveyism, which the uh, University of California Library has a copy of, uh, socialists were uh, quite active as late as the International UNIA Convention of 1924. And um, guest white speakers was, um, from time to time at UNA conventions uh, showed a radical bent. For instance, there was the guest white speaker at the 1921 convention, the noted pacifist and Communist Party member, Mrs. Rose Pastor Stokes. She pro proclaimed the glories of Bolshevism to the Liberty Hall audience and asked for an endorsement of the Soviet form of government. The delegates uh, in attendance... Uh, decided to withhold decision on the matter. One way to see the overall sort of effect, political attitude, let's say, of Garveyism as a movement, uh, not just the man, but the thousands of people who participated, people of different persuasions, one of the ways, and probably the best way, is to look at the Negro world, the weekly of the organization. This was the probably the one single most important cohesive force tending, tending to mitigate ever ominous threats of UNIA dissolution and division. Garvey's weekly newspaper was predicated on the presumption that it was the Negro newspaper. Its role was to aid the development of unity among black people. Um, Reading this paper, one should be struck by similarities to Mohammed Speaks today. Um, as for the Negro world, throughout its existence from 1918 to mid-1933, it consistently gave support to most any attempt to organize Negroes on a mass basis. 
Often newsworthiness seemed to be decided merely on having black people involved, irrespective of political content in the issue. For instance, uh, when U.S. Marines invaded Nicaragua in 1927, there appeared in the February 5th issue an account of the laboring masses rallying to the defense of their country under the leadership of the Liberal Party. The same Liberal Party was the villain of a February 19th story which told of a battalion of black women formed and led by a 20-year-old girl which fought to assist conservative forces, which recently, quote, recaptured the town of uh, Chinandega from the liberal troops, end quote. The paper was, uh, the Negro world, was not at all doctrinaire in choosing its sources. It had uh, quite a broad collection, in fact, of uh, news sources. Uh, many items were taken, for instance, from the Daily Worker, uh, some of the headlines of which ran the daily workers' stories put in the Negro world, quote, U.S. capitalists have new way to free Ethiopian slaves, quote, are the Philippines a Chinese problem, and Sacco and Vincenti petitions signed. Um, some of the worldwide newspapers, which had uh, regular uh, quotes taken from them, put in the Negro world, were the Gold Coast Leader, Gold Coast Times, Belazi Independence from uh, British Honduras, which had a columnist, uh, Garvey I. Uh, the South African Worker, the Johannesburg Star, the Rand Daily Mail, the Abantu Batho, a Johannesburg English African language paper, the Kingston Jamaica Daily Gleamer, and uh, any number of reports from Negro and white newspapers in the United States. Most of the foreign news dealt with Garveyite activities abroad, but there were many other stories, uh, such as the series run on labor strikes in Shanghai. Another series explained Hindu philosophy. A story taken from the South African worker told of how the African National Congress of South Africa had been taken over by moderates. And the worker warned, quote, as reprinted in the Negro world, the ANC will merely remain a name and not a very prominent one at that as so long as it neglects to concern itself with the main fight of the oppressed African native, namely the fight against capitalist exploitation, end quote. Now in another vein, and sort of an example of the really intriguing ambiguity of the Negro world, on February, in the February 19th, 1927 issue, there was a bold-faced item announcing that the Negro communist Richard B. Moore was falsely representing the UNIA at the Brussels International Congress of Oppressed Peoples. Moore was declared to have never been a member of the UNIA, and the article closed with the comment, quote, There is a great gulf fixed between communism and Garveyism, end quote. However, in the issue of August 15, 1927, there was a statement of the final resolutions of this Brussels Congress, which Moore had been in attendance at, with the added tagline stating that the Negro world was, quote, indebted to the press service of the League Against Imperialism and for National Independence. The League Against Imperialism and for National Independence was an organ of the Communist International. Now, this eclectic news policy of the Negro world seems attributable in part to many shifts in editorship. Although Marcus Garvey's name appeared as editor-in-chief, in actuality, according to a story by Pittsburgh Courier uh, reporter Floyd Calvin, control of the paper was given from the very first to assistant editors. During 1919 and in part of 1920, the militant W.A. Domingo was in charge. After his expulsion for socialist leanings by Garvey, the leadership was given to the more conservative William Ferris. Ferris accented a literary approach and gave much space to writers and historians on Negro and African life. The paper retained as assistants to Ferris at least two socialists in Hubert Harrison and Eric Walren. In the mid-twenties, the one-time Henry George supporter, T. Thomas Fortune, was editor-in-charge. Later, it was Reverend R. T. Brown, and finally, the highly intellectual Hindu, an immigrant from Hubila, India, H. Uh, G. Mudgall. One of the progressive traits of the Negro world was its shortage of stories on big-name Negroes of the black bourgeoisie, the type of reporting which dominated most Negro papers. Uh, international news items rarely dealt with African chieftains, 
uh, the sort of black bourgeoisie of Africa. In contrast, editor Du Bois of the crisis sought to stimulate interest in Africa with a large number of features on royalty of the fatherland. Uh, the social page of the Garvey paper was devoted to club news of the UNIA, accounts of branch picnics, and other affairs. The saccharine gossip stories on Negro notables were almost non-existent. Uh, perhaps Garvey's Garvey's jealousy of competitors for his greatness dictated the downplay on Negro leaders. Then again, there was little support for the UNIA among the black bourgeoisie, hence a uh, few who could merit comment in the UNIA press. Lack of middle-class support for Garveyites can be discerned in the advertising of the Negro world, which was, consisted of individual shop owners, occultists, patent medicines, a large Bayer aspirin ad, and appeals to buy Madame Walker's hair conditioner. Um, conspicuously absent were the usual type of Negro press ads, ads for insurance, Negro insurance companies or this or that college or finishing school. And with the exception of Madame Walker, there were no enticements for bleaching creams or hair straighteners. Madame Walker happened to be a heavy contributor to the UNIA, which explains her advertising, which was carefully worded to avoid reference to straightening hair and accent conditioning instead. Garveyites were opposed to falsifying of African beauty. However, on the uh, touchy subject of hair, there was no concerted effort to get, get Negroes to go natural. No rulings were made. Rather, Garveyites just let things lie. The Negro world displayed a militancy in uh, bits and snatches and often isolated, unrelated items. There was much more labor news than in most uh, race weeklies. The communist-sponsored American Negro Labor Congresses in 1925 and 27 were well covered. Amy Jacks Garvey's Woman's Page was unique among Negro newspaper women's pages. Mrs. Garvey was a thoroughgoing advocate of intellectual emancipation for women. Items in her su section accented subjects of interest to the feminine crusaders of the flapper era. There were many reports of women in Asia and Africa freeing themselves from traditional customs of subordination to the male. Um, Mrs. Garvey's woman's page was headlined, Our Women and What They Think, she aimed to make them think. In all sections of the Negro world, uh, praise for the new Negro was overused. Still, there was criticism of, quote, sappy new Negro literature, um, which uh, the Negro world felt... Uh, was uh, using sensationalism as a selling point to reach white audiences. Um, in the final analysis, it can be said with certainty that Garveyite showed radical potential, and it uh, didn't fully realize itself because of personal battles and inability to come to firm decisions. And in addition, uh, radicalism went uh, unrealized because of counter tendencies in the movement pulling toward a conservatism. Although the UNIA uh, had little support from established black middle classes, this is not to say that there was, was not a sizable percentage of Garveyites who deeply coveted such support. The conservative tendency was shown in the rhetoric of, of uh, promoting UNIA businesses. And from pronouncements, one could hardly know that these enterprises were cooperatives. Individuals were urged to buy stock and invent, invest capital. Free enterprise business jargon was uh, mixed in with talk of black nobility and of the African uh, empire um, as well. Garvey uh, was a severe critic of socialist, and they in turn considered this a sign of Garvey conservatism. A uh, socialist would not admit that Garvey criticized them both with conservative arguments that uh, socialists were too radical and with radical arguments that socialists were too conservative. On the one hand, Garvey employed the standard anti-socialist cliché that uh, they were seeking bloody revolution for their own ulterior motives. On the other hand, he condemned the left for relying too heavily on a coalition with the white labor movement which was permeated with racism and discriminatory policies toward blacks. Here, the onus of conservatism was directed at the leftists. Garvey also questioned the radicalism of socialism in the international sphere. Since it was a European-dominated movement, 
and um, hence white dominated. Uh, he saw it as an uh, untrustworthy ally of colored peoples. Today, socialism is a powerful force in Western Europe, and yet the nations of that area are engaged in neo-colonialist exploitation of Asia and Africa. This would tend to suggest some validity to Garvey's thesis. His theoretical uh, findings, however, were not his main argument against socialists. For the most part, he denounced them for failing to support race unity through the UNIA. To move on, uh, there are so many other things that uh, could be said about this movement, but to convey a picture, let us just close with a description of the 1922 convention, the real turning point of Garveyism. The summer of 1922 was the turning point. The white establishment was out to get the movement and about to arrest the leader on a charge of using males to defraud. Uh, within the ghetto, there were anti-Garvey factions which were marshalling an ever stronger attack on Garveyites. Uh, there were black leftists and liberals who uh, took the uh, occasion of uh, division here in 1922 to organize a number of uh, anti-Garvey demonstrations and meetings. Within the UNIA itself, there was a growing fraction uh, ready and willing to curb the leader's influence. As we approached the, let's say, the convention of August, um, we see a dissolution of post-World War I black radicalism in general, that there had been a subsiding of fervor after 1919 and the problems of that year, race riots and so forth. And with the declining fervor, there had been a decline in Garveyism from 1920 on, loss of membership and uh, particularly some problems around money, uh, what happened to uh, expenditures of, um, for steamships? Garvey uh, was paying uh, extortionist rates for steamships he bought for his Back to Africa line. The whites overcharged him, much as Negroes get overcharged for buying a house in the suburbs today. Uh, whites overcharged for Garvey for buying steamships to go back to Africa. Uh, there were other problems um, spending money, though Garvey and, uh, and his lieutenants made very little in, in, in uh, personal take-home pay. Uh, still all sorts of aside uh, uh, money spent out. Uh, Garvey donated a lot of money under the table to get news stories put in newspapers concerning the movement to popularize the, the movement. Uh, uh, little things of this sort added up. And uh, as of the 1922 um, convention, um, there was a, move, a widespread feeling that something must be done to tighten the movement, to put it together, to draw together uh, um, the finances in a rational way. Most of all, though, for the 1922 convention, there was the problem of Garvey's meeting with the Ku Klux Klan. In uh, July 1922, Garvey had met with the Ku Klux Klan, pardon me, in June of 1922. He traveled to Atlanta to interview the imperial wizard of the Klan to discuss the Back to Africa plan. In Garvey's view, whites were whites, all to be shunned, and uh, might as well work with one as well as the other. His Imperial Highness uh, would not see Garvey and sent instead the assistant Imperial Wizard. Returning to Harlem, Garvey was quoted in the Negro uh, Weekly in the New York Age as saying that in reference to the Klan, quote, the attitude of Negroes should not be to fight it, not to aggravate it, but to think of what it means and say and do nothing. It will not help us to fight it or its program. The Negro numerical disadvantage in this country is too great. The wish of 15 million Negroes means nothing when 90 million white men do not wish it. Um, and uh, how should the Afro-American solve this problem? Um, Garvey answered, the only way it can be solved is for the Negro to create a government of his own in Africa. Now, compromising with the heinous Ku Klux Klan gave critics of Garvey a powerful argument. <laughs> 
And uh, critics were now as prevalent within the movement as without. The Reverend James Eason had emerged in the movement as a leader of a strong Garvey opposition, um, members of which were saying, quote, uh, quote the Chicago Defender, if the movement is to succeed, Garvey must follow others who possess saner and wiser policies. Now, this comes from a Garveyite of the uh, faction about to do battle with Garvey. At the 1922 convention, Garvey maneuvered to avoid a floor fight by springing an announcement that he was resigning his post. Then, in front of a packed Liberty Hall audience, he personally accused Eason of double-dealing him and attempting to ruin his empire. And the Reverend Eason, leader of the opposition, angered by the remark, uh, rushed at the speaker's platform with fists tightened and had to be forcibly restrained from punching Garvey. Uh, police outside the hall had to be called in to quell the subsequent disturbance. Continuing his maneuvering, Garvey allowed himself to be made to stay on in his post, but added his desire that the association leadership be reorganized in such a way that half of the top two dozen offices would cease to be elective and instead be chosen by the president general, who was Garvey. Previously, all had been elected from the floor of the convention. The reorganization plan was agreed to, and for the remaining elective offices, Garvey announced a slate of approved candidates. Omitted were a number of names of men then in office. Garvey was to have his way at this convention, but it was not without a fight. The elections were bitterly fought. In one case, the Garvey candidate lost in a runoff vote 92 to 85. But Garvey announced that the majority was too slim. Garvey was sort of the Speaker of the House here on this vote, and he called for another vote. It was already past midnight, and it was around 1 o'clock when the re-vote found the Garvey supporter a victor by 17 votes. 17-vote uh, margin, which Garvey considered an acceptable majority. The showing of Garvey critics, although defeated, creates a picture of a more dynamic organization than the usually imagined one-man show. And outside the convention hall of the, during 1922 convention, socialists and uh, liberals together, working the integrationist mystique of opposing uh, Garvey, held forth with a number of street rallies. There were also outside the hall a number of um, sort of uh, black nationalists of other persuasions than Garveyism. For instance, there was Cyril Briggs of the African Blood Brotherhood, a Marxist black nationalist who um, had with him uh, Makota um, Manodi, a visitor from South Africa. Manodi's opinions, uh, to quote, we are not favorably impressed with the unmitigated presumption of this man Garvey in electing himself provisional president of Africa. And in reference to a Garvey remark about his enemies soon meeting their Waterloo, Manodi remarked, um, we are bothered less by the water in Waterloo than by the gas in Garvey and the gullibility of his poor dupes. Um, night after night, Briggs and Manodi derided the Garveyites and on August 11th, at the corner of 135th and 7th Avenue, there was a, quite a street brawl when, between uh, Briggs forces and Garvey forces. Minotti was trying to speak, and Garveyites attacked. Uh, police stopped the Garveyites and let Minotti go on. The uh, first week in September, with the uh, convention over, there were at least four separate meetings of organizations specifically out to denounce Garvey. One uh, was led by Reverend Eason, now out of the UNIA. He had left to form his own Negro Improvement Association. He distinguished his organization as one interested in problems of Negroes in the United States rather than elsewhere. Um, According to Eason, there were many immediate pressing problems in this country, which would, quote, which would leave no time for activity abroad. Um, the problems of Garveyites after the convention um, um, sort of snowballed rapidly, one after another, um, and led to the dissolution of the movement. It really cracked it open, although it existed on till the end of the 1920s as the leading Negro organization. It was the convention and the fall of 
you know, 22 in the next year of 1923, which really uh, brought to an end this uh, greatest of all movement as a really powerful force. Um, in the fall of 1922, the opposition, now that there had been such a division and Garvey had made the mistake of uh, dealing with the Klan, um, the opposition unified socialists, liberals, and others got together. There was a nationwide tour um, which uh, A. Philip Randolph, Chandler Owen, and William Pickens toured the country to discredit Garvey with the slogan, Garvey Must Go. There was a letter uh, signed by a number of leading Negroes to the Attorney General of the United States asking that Garvey be prosecuted for mail fraud. Uh, the case had been pending and not been pushed forward. And the activities of Eason became something of a sensation and a uh, real tragedy. He had been a minister in Philadelphia before joining the UNIA, and when he broke with Garvey, he returned to his home city to seek support for his new organization. He was given a rough time there by local Garveyites, who stopped his supporters in the streets and intimidated and manhandled them. While speaking in Chicago in November, a Garveyite shot and seriously wounded a Negro policeman. That's while Eason was speaking there, and the assailant had been trying to hit Eason. In December, Eason was in New Orleans trying to take advantage of widespread unrest within the Garvey movement in that city. Around this time, it became known that he had agreed to be a star prosecution witness at the pending Garvey trial on mail fraud. New Year's evening, Eason held one last meeting in New Orleans before leaving to testify in the Garvey trial. The meeting over, he was walking back to his place of residence when two men stepped out of a dark alleyway, called his name, and shot him down. Before he died, Eason identified the assailants as members of the UNIA in New Orleans. Two weeks later, the two men were picked up after a mass raid on the local Garvey headquarters. The defendants pleaded innocent, but added that Eason had it coming. In the wake of the Klan episode and uh, Eason assassination, there came the climactic mail fraud trial. Garvey probably could have won an acquittal. His three co-defendants won their cases. To Garvey, however, the trial was political rather than judicial. The initial prosecution statement implied an attempt to defame the movement in its entirety. Now, this has often been overlooked in histories of the Garvey movement. It is uh, often emphasized, or most often it is emphasized, that uh, this trial was pushed by Negro opponents of Garveyism. But uh, here is the... Uh, from the uh, part of the initial prosecution statement on the, uh, in this famous trial. Quote, While their center around Garvey, other, other associations or corporations having for their object the uplift of the advancement of the Negro race, the entire scheme of uplift was used to persuade Negroes for the most part to buy shares of stock in the Black Star Line when defendants well knew that said shares were not and in all human probability could never be worth $5 or any other sum of money. That's, uh, there's some dot, dot, dots in that, but there is statement of the prosecution. And against this, Garvey set out to prove that the UNIA was in fact, quote, more intent on the ultimate uplifting and salvation that was promised to the Negro race of America than in the paltry profits that might be realized from the stock investment. As uh, one of the lawyers for Garvey's defendants put it, quote, if every Negro could have put every dime, every penny into the sea, and if he might get in exchange the knowledge that he was somebody, that he meant something in the world, he would gladly do it. The Black Star Line was a loss in money, but it was a gain in soul, End quote. The trial took an entire month from April into May of 1923. There were days of testimony by UNIA members as to how much the movement had done for the Negro. Impatient with legalisms of his attorney, Garvey dismissed his lawyer and proceeded to defend himself, taking liberal opportunities to lecture on problems of color and related subjects, which were unrelated to the question of mail fraud. Convicted, Garvey made an unsuccessful appeal. The Supreme Court refused to review his case, and in 1925, the UNIA leader entered Atlanta Penitentiary to serve a five-year sentence. Two years later, as a reward for Garvey's endorsement of Coolidge, President Coolidge in 1924 elections, uh, Coolidge pardoned him and Garvey was deported as an undesirable alien.
Even uh, with Garvey out of the country, the UNIA in the United States remained a sizable, if smaller, organization. And uh, throughout the late 20s, uh, Garveyites continued active in most cities of America. The Negro World reported local branches holding fundraising events, community debates, outings, and sponsoring lectures by notables. Mm -hmm. If the UNIA could uh, still claim to be a mass movement, though, in the late 20s, it was, it was really a claim by default because there was little in the way of other mass movements during this period. Um, grassroots radicalism would uh, really emerge again in a mass basis in the early 30s, and uh, then it would be socialist and communist-led, many of the black socialist and communist in the 1930s being ex-Garveyites. <laughs> 